Yeah, it's it's been a long time, almost what is it, fifty one years, fifty two years since uh, we've seen Earth from that distance. So, hey, y'all, it's Doctor Know It All. I am super honored today to be with Scott Kid Potet, or Kid, as you go by, who is going to be one of the crew members on the upcoming Polaris Dawn mission, which is now scheduled to launch at the end of August. Is that correct, or is it September? End of now? August. Yeah, we yeah. just went official with a launch date of the twenty uh, sixth. Cool. All uh, right, we're. We're one week away from quarantine starting. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, well, we're virtual anyway. So I was going to say it was good I caught you, but it doesn't really matter because it would be, uh, hopefully the germs would not transmit through the uh, internet. <laughs> so, yeah. So tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. I noticed that you were a Thunderbird pilot, which is pretty darn amazing. That's yeah. uh, that's no small accomplishment on its own. So, yeah, let, let us know about your background. Absolutely. So uh, I pretty much grew up in the New Hampshire Seacoast area. A small town called Durham, about an hour north of Boston. Um, okay. uh, went through elementary, middle school, high school, college, all in the same town. Um, I was a, I'm a self admitted terrible student. Um, <laughs> grades were academics were not my st- strong suit. Um, right, but I was fairly active. Um, a cross country state champion in New Hampshire uh, in high school, and that more or less got me into college. Um, okay. Going to the University of New Hampshire. Um, right. Ended up getting a degree in outdoor education. Um, so spent four years scuba diving, rock climbing, winter mountaineering, white water rafting. <laughs> I'm like, what was I doing out. majoring in physics? I should have done that. That would have been <laughs> way more fun. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, well, I, I got involved in the ROTC program pretty early on oh, cool. my freshman okay. year. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I was just looking for an academic program that I could uh, really enjoy because I wanted to be a fire pilot, you know. Right, and, right. Um, my exposure to that, uh, growing up in the eighties, you know, with the original Top Gun came out, the movie, the right yeah. stuff was kind of a spark to, Hey, I would love to do something like this. Um, right. so I looked into the RTC, RTC program and they were offering a, uh, go in the back of a KC 135 and, and just watch them refuel F-16s. Right. Cool. Uh, so I signed up, went to that, saw some S and refueled. I, I puked the entire mission. Um, <laughs> I'm I am prone to motion sickness. Um, uh oh, uh oh, that does not bode well yeah. for the first twenty four hours uh, <laughs> up in space. So yeah. <laughs> well, they say it's completely unpredictable. Uh, okay. Space adaptation okay. syndrome is a lot different from motion sickness. So cross my fingers. Um, there you go. <laughs> but I, I'm a I'm a puke and rally kind of guy. Um, <laughs> That so was your we'll entire college how... experience. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Hypothetical. Uh, but it was, you know, that experience kind of sparked my interest in ROTC. Um, fast right. forward, I graduated um, and went in, got commissioned and went to pilot training and spent 20 years in the Air Force. Um, right. Throughout my Air Force career, I, I had was blessed with a lot of uh, different experiences. Uh, graduated the Fighter Weapons School, which is the Air Force version of Top Gun. Uh, selected to be cool. a Thunderbird demonstration pilot, so did that for a couple of years. Um, I commanded the aggressors, so more or less replicating the bad guys uh, to help our guys train. Right. Is that is that uh, how you ended up getting hooked up with Jared? Because I know that he kind of did some of that stuff too. Kind of in, a, in both those experiences, being a Thunderbird as well as the aggressor commander, uh, okay. were my connection with Jared originally. That was 10, 15 right. years ago when, yeah. when uh, gotcha. we originally met. Uh, but as you know, he's he's an avid uh, pilot himself. Um, uh, and has he evolved and progressed through his aviation career uh, in the later stages when he got into fighter jets? That's, that's kind of where uh, right. we got hooked up. Um, with he was doing a civilian demonstration team, and then later that evolved into providing adversary support in, as a contract uh, right, service, right. which was a very successful. And and man, uh, I can't tell you how much I wish I knew that that was an actual legitimate career option. I was like, darn it! Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah that, uh, it was uh, it was a brilliant idea. I mean, we had, yeah. we've yeah. done it since the early seventies, right? You know, post Vietnam era. Uh, when we experienced some losses and, and needed to figure out a new way to train, they came up right. with Red Flag and, and the aggressors. Um, uh, so uh, he just t- took it to the next level by providing a, a lot more cost-effective solution, u- utilizing you know retired, washed-up fighter pilots like myself, <laughs> um, and you know privately c- procured um, right. uh, fleets of fighter jets. Uh, that were be otherwise, you know, sent to the boneyard. Right. Right. Um, 
so anyways, uh, we did that for several years and that was very successful providing that, uh, that service. But, uh, that was my Air Force career. Um, I retired yeah, in yeah. 2016. Right. Right. Okay. Um, I was coming off of a, um, deployment to Afghanistan, uh, flying my last combat tour. Uh, and I just, I didn't have the, the motivation to join the airlines. Um, I wanted to right. do something different. Right. Uh, and based on my relationship, I, uh, when I had met Jared, he said, um, you know, come, come work for me at, uh, at Draken. Cool. Um, so I jumped on board and, and we did that for about five years until, uh, you know, his, uh, his passion for aviation evolved into space exploration. Say, literally aimed higher. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. He's, he's a visionary. So it was just a, a natural progression. Right. Right. Uh, based on the conversations he was having with SpaceX. And, uh, yeah. And so that kind of kicked off our, um, our quest with Inspiration4. Right. And you were mission director. Is that correct for Inspiration4? Mission. You know, I, I cringe every time I hear that term, but more or less, yes, I, I was the uh, director, coordinator, manager of the program on the right. Inspiration4 side. Okay. You know, when I think of mission director at this point in my um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my space journey, uh, it's all about the, the mission directors in mission control who are, who are doing the legit uh, uh, control and, and uh, running the show. My role during Inspiration4 was just to help coordinate uh, logistics, uh, the fundraising piece, anything and everything. Um, I was just inspired by uh, the whole vision of the project uh, and wanted to contribute and, and help out, uh, you know, as much as I possibly could. Um, right, right. Dual had, I was just working for Jared on the Shift 4 side after he had uh, sold off Draken. Right. Um, so I was I was doing some things for Shift Four, but um, once the space thing came up, I was like, <laughs> "That's mo that's more my style." <laughs> I was like, "I will volunteer <laughs> for this." So yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it, it was such a, a a great concept because you know when he first told me about it, it was like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" Uh, and he's like, "You're not going on this, dude. This is all right. about we need to prove that uh, space is accessible to any and everyone." Right. Um, so we randomly selected his crew. He had this uh, grand vision, which was extremely successful partnership with St. Jude, raising 250 million bucks. So right. it was um, it was just a, a, an awesome project to be involved with. And, right. and that kind of kicked right. everything off. That's great. Yeah. And uh, FYI, I did apply to be on that mission. So <laughs> of course I did, because I was like, who wouldn't? Um, so and and I've applied to be an astronaut twice and made it past the first round or two, but never have gotten too deep nice. into it so anyway yeah i'm i'm quite uh the elephant in the room is i'm quite jealous of you because i would, uh, I would uh, <laughs> my wife is always like you're crazy and i'm like to this day if somebody said you want to go up in space tomorrow i would be like just sign me in <laughs> so, I, know. I know that the reality it's... is years of training to get there but yeah so <laughs> yeah well inspiration for crew that was man i think we told them in february Right. And they launched September. So yeah, that crazy. was a, that was a quick turn for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not quite like our, our, uh, our quest over, uh, the Polaris. Yeah. Uh, we're yes. approaching three oh. years now. Yeah. Let's talk about that. I, I want to talk about like the training and everything, but first just let's discuss the mission profile. I am, I was telling you before we started recording, I'm a huge space geek. My favorite sort of, um, what mission series is actually Gemini because I feel like it's the middle child and it was always left out and nobody, re but it's like it established everything. Putting people up on the Mercuries was basically just throwing some people up as a stunt. They really didn't do much. And Apollo was the outgrowth of Gemini. But I mean, we're talking about first multiple ships in space at the same time, first rendezvous, first docking, first spacewalk. I mean, it, all of these first that happened, well, for the United States, of course, then there was the, the Soviets that were doing it too. But, but yeah, so why... A spacewalk why 1400 kilometers max altitude why do all these crazy things i first off i appreciate that that um comparison analogy obviously we're standing on their shoulders um yeah. they've accomplished so much more and and we would not be where we're at without the the um achievements of nasa right. uh and what they've done thus far with mercury uh gemini apollo shuttle program um but yeah, that was kind of the 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 first analogy that that we came up with when we started these discussions with uh, SpaceX. It was 
towards the tail end of Inspiration Four, right before their launch, Jared continued his conversations about you know what's what's next, what could Chapter Two right. look like, and um, and in standard Jared fashion, it's like it, it, it's it's got to be <laughs> elevated at this point. So this was more of a concept of hey, can we come up with a program that is uh, a developmental focused uh, project, uh, multi mission, um, and and what does SpaceX want to accomplish over the next, right. you know, three, five, 10 plus years. Um, and obviously suits was part of that discussion, but, but, you know, based on the negotiations and, and the, um, uh, the conversations he was having is the collaboration between the, the Polaris team and, and SpaceX. Um, right. It was a perfect marriage. And the fact that we've been working, we had been working with them with inspiration for, um, and everyone was motivated and everyone's committing resources to make this happen. And right. w- with a, with a focus on, uh, uh operational, uh, development, uh, type, uh, program, you know, the first conversation he, uh, Jared had with, with Elon about what could we accomplish? You know, they yeah. started coming up with these grandiose ideas and very similar to what NASA did with the Gemini project. You know, you got initial space right. flight with Mercury. Let's just get to space. Right. Uh, and then the quest to get to the moon with the Apollo program. Well, right. h- what do we need to accomplish to make that leap that. to get to the lunar surface? You know, and, and just like you talked about, it's we got to figure out how to dock. We got to do multi crew missions, longer durations. We got to do a spacewalk. Right. All of these things have to be accomplished before we can even think about getting to the lunar surface. Right. Uh, in a similar fashion, SpaceX is kind of making this transition from the Falcon 9, very proven rocket, right. focused on low Earth orbit, getting to the ISS. Um, and then eventually they're make, making this transition to um, Starship. Yeah. And just uh, FYI, I'm going to put this up real quick. Yeah. This is a CGI right. rendition of the spacewalk. So obviously not reality, but just so continue talking about this. But I thought people would enjoy seeing this as kind of a hypo- hypothetical of what it might look like. So, yeah, you bet. And, and, and so the end result of the conversation was a, a collaborative program that that involves up to three missions. Uh, we affectionately called it the the Polaris program with the first mission being Polaris Dawn. And then ultimately the third mission being the first human flight of Starship. Right. And and um, has, has anybody found out what the what the middle mission is or do you guys kind of mum on that at the moment? <laughs> no, we're still working through, uh, okay. you know, everything and anything's on the table. Obviously, what's what's been in, you know, on social and in the media about uh, conversations regarding Hubble, those are still ongoing conversations. Right. But that would be very overall, cool, by the way, <laughs> that'd be very. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> but but the biggest, you know, focus is whatever we accomplish on Polaris Dawn and what we learn, we want to leverage that and continue this evolution of developing and moving forward. Uh, and just like we've set these lofty objectives with Polaris Dawn, we just want to continue moving the needle. We're going to, we're going to uh, push and, and, and eventually we'll get back to the lunar surface and Mars and beyond. Um, and so um, based on these conversations, we came up with the, the four primary objectives for Polaris Dawn, which is obviously um, right around the corner with a, right. a launch date of August 26th. Um <laughs> And the four objectives being, you know, doing the first commercial spacewalk, uh, right. setting an altitude, low Earth orbit altitude record, um, uh, testing Starlink from space for the very first time, and, right. and then the the forty or so science and research experiments uh, that we have lined up. All, you know, those were selected based on, again, what are the challenges that humans face with longer duration missions? What what based on the limitations and challenges that we have of, of living in this capsule uh, that will be brought down to vacuum, what experiments can we do that that's going to help push that needle? So uh, those are the four primary objectives. And, um, uh, and that's what we've been working on for the last two and a half, almost three years now is to prepare for that. And, and a lot of people ask, well, why all the delays, you know, why is it taking so long? Well, in the big scheme of things, it, it really hasn't. It's, yeah. you know, three yeah. years is nothing to develop a suit that is designed right. to go 
out in the vacuum of space. Right. So. Uh, and and also, uh, I, I can't recall if this is a first or not, but also to be your primary suit while you're flying the, the, the craft as well. And that's a big deal because usually the EVA suits are just gigantic, bulky things that you put on that you would not you would not normally wear in the cabin. So that's really cool. As yeah. Well. And, and the fact that, you know, what are the, what are the known entities going into this project? It's like, we're going to be on dragon. Dragon right. has never been brought down to vacuum. Right. So they had to do modifications to the, to the systems and, and make sure it could withstand the, the, you know, the, the challenges of, of uh, operating in, in a space environment. Right. Um, uh, and then they got to design a, a spacesuit. Um, yep. and, and that was, I would say the biggest challenge that SpaceX faced over this, the course of the, the couple of years is, you know, how do we design a spacesuit? And they started off with the baseline, the IVA suit, right. um, and going into it, we knew there was limited capacity in this vehicle. Um, and, and so therefore one suit was the only option really, uh, right. there was no right. option to, to do an MU kind of you know, self-contained suit and store four of those inside this capsule. And unlike right. the ISS with multiple modules, there's, we got to bring the entire capsule down to vacuum. Therefore right. we're all in these EVA suits. And, and technically we we're all participating in the EVA. And this, yep. uh, as far as I know, this is the first time that four astronauts have, have been involved in the same EVA at once. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I guess the, the record before would have been, was it Apollo 9 where they did the EVA? Uh, that's a little known mm -hmm. fact that most people don't know that there was an EVA in Apollo, but, uh, but yeah. So, um, but, but, you know, you look at this, this, uh, this spacesuit is, uh, this is the one, right? This, I mean, or at least something, I've, obviously there's an evolution of it all the time, but it looks at first glance very much like the the one that you would just wear on a normal mission to the ISS or something. So it's very impressive that it's, maintained the slim profile it doesn't look super bulky of course there's no life support system on it it's cabled into the the, the craft itself but uh but you know <laughs> this is a spaceship right there i mean that's effectively what that is Ab absolutely and, it, and yeah. it's proven i mean we yeah. about a month ago we did our vacuum test down at uh johnson space center right and you know in pairs we'd go into the chamber and bring it down to vacuum um, right. And we were in our flight suits, proven that, uh, you know, the, t for us to experience, obviously, to test the suit and uh, right. for us to experience uh, and build the confidence uh, in the suit itself. And yeah, <laughs> probably very, very comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, cool. Very, very comfortable suit. Um, you know, it, it's hard, especially with the reclined seats um, and, and the durations that we do spend in the suit pressurized. It's hard not to fall asleep. Um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so we, we, we have a tendency to take these micro naps, uh, right, but we got to right. constantly do these, uh, calm checks, uh, just to make sure that we're all awake and paying attention. Right. Right. Um, there you go. <laughs> Don't fall asleep on but, us there, man. <laughs> uh, but the suit is, is very, um, very similar to the IVA. Um, what's unique about the entire process was, Every time we'd show up for training and, you know, it was more or less every other week ish for the last couple of years, some new modification would have been accomplished um, and they'd have done something. And it, we ultimately had built this like Frankenstein type suit um, because they would go through all these different iterations. They tried the, you know, the different joints, uh, different type of innovative technology to see what would work better uh, under different pressurizations. Uh, the thermals were constantly a focus mobility, obviously a big deal with the EVA, um, right. cooling, um, and avionics, the HUD was just this simple little, you know, literally we left on a Friday, showed up on Monday and they had this new, you know, very basic, uh, heads up display, uh, modified on the, on the helmet on Monday. And, and since then, they've gone through multiple iterations to come up with what we're going to actually use for flight. So, right, right. Uh, it's Very all cool. one piece. Um, you don and doff the suit with a uh, more or less a spiral waist zipper, but it's all attached to the helmet and, and the top and bottom are all the same. You kind of wiggle wow. in, in the arms initially, and okay. then the, the helmet uh, goes over the cranium. 
Uh, and then once you get the upper body situated, you kind of like, uh, just put on your pants and, and spiral zipper right. and, um, you have a bladder zipper and, and an external, uh, okay. zipper, um, all on the waist. Uh, and then you have uh, similar spiral zippers on each arm. Um, wow. Allows you to have, you know, your arms exposed, uh, to, if you know, outside of pressurization to, uh, to do any type of work that you need to be done. Right. Uh, right. But what's pretty amazing is, is the, um, uh, dexterity of the gloves. Um, uh, you know, it was quite eye opening. from, I had been using, uh, a modified IVA suit throughout training for the longest time. And then the first right. time I got into my flight suit pressurized, Right. I'm like, yeah, you know, they pressurize it. I'm like, okay, you guys can, can pressurize it any time. And they're like, no kid, you're, you are pressurized right now. <laughs> no, it was just way, like, really? Wow. The, yeah. The mobility was uh, a lot better than the actual IVA suit that I experienced. Um, wow. Wow. So yeah, that's very cool. So, so yeah. So let's talk, um, uh, I, I, as long as we're talking about suits, let's go a little bit down this rabbit hole here. So uh, there's there's a you know Hollywood trope of oh we got to go out and like blast the asteroid and the guys just they're in the suit and they just go whoop and they throw the spacesuit on they're out the door. Nothing could be further from the truth. I mean I know this from scuba diving that we're dealing with multiple different pressure profiles. We're dealing with different O2 nitrogen pro profiles. Um, there are a lot of steps that you have to go through in order not to basically get the bends, you know, to get the uh, decompression illness. Um, so, so how do you go about like dealing with that in, in, in leading up to it? I, I, I hear that your profile is actually quite unique in on the Polaris Dawn because you're going to actually start after you launch, basically, as soon as you launch, you're going to start changing the uh, pressure and the um, atmospheric concentrations in the cabin. Correct. A absolutely and that's yeah okay. was one of the challenges of doing an eva and and uh you know bringing the capsule down to vacuum long enough to make it a productive productive uh experience right uh we're limited on capacity and and uh amount of gaseous uh that we can bring with us nitrogen oxygen and nitrox yeah. yeah um so therefore it's like we don't have the luxury to do a, a multi-hour pre-breathe on 100% oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, we had to come up with a creative solution uh, to, to mitigate and, and prevent us from getting the bends. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, decompression sickness. Right. Um, so, 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 uh, so just for people who might not, so, I mean, at, at earth atmosphere of near sea level, we're at one bar or 15.1 PSI. Is that correct? Anyway, so we have approximately 14.7. 50.7. So sorry, I was thinking metrics. So <laughs> I have a hard time remembering Imperial stuff. But anyway, but at, you're not at, or are you at that in the cabin itself? So on a normal mission to the ISS, would you normally be at one bar or 15.7 PSI uh, for the duration? Uh, or lower than that? 14.7. 14 and I, I okay. Uh, okay. don't, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think uh, they are. Uh, yeah. They have that ability or that luxury on the ISS. Yeah. Okay. We have come up with this like stair-stepping protocol that um, uh, starts out at a certain PSI, atmospheric uh, PSI and then slowly work our way down to right. ultimately vacuum. Yeah, so so tell me about, so, so you start off at 21% uh, oxygen, basically the um, atmospheric mix, right, with uh, about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Is that correct when you launch or...? You know, I would uh, I would be guessing on what the final numbers are going to be, and I know they right. work through the protocol, um, and they're constantly tweaking it. Um, but just to take a take a step back, we went to uh, JSC a couple of years ago to kind of run through a similar profile just to get data points. We had our own doppelgangers. You know, there was eight uh, participants in this just to get uh, uh, more. Um, more data. Right. Um, and then since then they've kind of evolved uh, the protocol over, over the course of a couple of years. And, and ultimately we're going to start below atmospheric pressure, 14.7. Okay. It's um, it's, it's lower than that, but with a slightly higher oxygen concentration. Okay. Okay. Uh, and we're going to be there for a couple days. 
Um, and then there'll be a, it's a five step phase down. Okay. Um, and then we'll slowly lower the PSI a over a course of a couple hours. We'll bump right. up the oxygen and then again, we'll slowly work down and then eventually we'll get into our suits uh, and then 100% oxygen. Hopefully, dilute ourselves of all, you know, risks, bubbles, nitrogen bubbles. Right. Um, and then we'll we'll bring it on down to vacuum once we're pressurized. Cool. And and the suits are at about five psi, or about a third of atmospheric. Is that correct? Yeah, just above five psi. Okay. Gotcha. PSID. So yeah. Um, cool. It will it will decrease as our cabin pressure decreases. Right, right. Okay. And um, so, I mean, for just really quickly, it's the old soda bottle thing. Like if you unscrew a soda bottle really fast, it bubbles up. You don't want this happening in your body because there's a lot of nitrogen in particular that's um, that's in, it, it's basically in liquid form at atmospheric pressure. If you suddenly release that pressure, it would boil, which would be a terrible thing <laughs> in your body. Yes. Uh, and so, so you want to lower that and you want to get rid of as much nitrogen in your bloodstream as possible at the same time, which is why you're moving towards pure oxygen at that point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And, yeah. and okay. that's, that's a great analogy and, and it's good for everyone to kind of understand that concept. Yeah. And yeah. That's what we're trying to avoid. Right. Okay, so the second piece of this is the suits. When you're actually in vacuum, and of course, this was a big problem for, for Gemini and for Apollo and for the Soviets and, and the space shuttle and everybody, especially the hands, but also the elbows, the shoulders, everything. You're in a balloon, basically, right? If you think about it, if you, if you imagine a giant balloon that's blown up, it's going to be stiff. It has a great deal of stiffness. So how has SpaceX, you know, worked on these joints to make them as mobile as possible when you're in a five PSI suit in zero, you know, zero pressure? So th and that's the technology that they've uh, developed and innovated right. over the last few years. Uh, they've right. gone through many, many different iterations of, of that joint. Um, yeah. And there's one on the shoulder, there's one on the elbow, there's one on the wrists, um, all providing those uh movements so you can kind of like in a runner's position um mm -hmm. uh, the shoulder will rotate in that direction um the arm will rotate and the, and the wrist will rotate and even pressurized uh those are uh mobility functions if you will uh that right. that we can utilize to do whatever we need to do whether it's you know, in, in Jared and Sarah's case, open and close the hatch uh, manually, um, you know, because initially they have a, a, a revolving safety lever that will right. release the lock. And then they, they can manually uh, open the hatch and close the hatch so they can operate that way. Uh, and then the whole purpose, once they are doing the EVA uh, outside the capsule, they will be doing uh, certain drills and experiments uh, associated with the movement to, to, to better understand uh, the mobility of this suit. Yeah, there you go. That's, right, uh, right. You yeah. Know, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's, that's exactly uh, the movement that Jared and Sarah would would execute in order to close or, or open right, hatch. Right. And, and this, it sounds like the, there's the focus has been on the upper body, not as much on the lower body. So this would not be an EVA suit. You would probably want to use on the moon or Mars because it sounds like it might have to have good lower body mobility. Um, but I, or am I wrong about that from understanding? Uh, it, you know, it's, it, I believe it's the same joints. Uh, oh, okay. For, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, for the knees yeah. and, um, or, I guess it would be, yeah, I, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, but okay. yes, the big focus ha has been the upper body. Uh, right. I guess it's a blessing of being in space. You, uh, you float more <laughs> or less until you're yeah. on, you know, some gravitational uh, properties, whether you're on the lunar surface or Mars. Um, right. uh, but, but they'll certainly get there. And, you know, the, the whole purpose of this uh, developmental program was to, you got to start somewhere. Um, yeah. and a lot of people yeah. ask about the, the umbilical core, uh, you know, umbilical, um, uh, just again, based on limitations that we experience in this capsule and the capacity, uh, right. that is the, the life support that we're utilizing for this. Uh, what we learn from this experience and this mission, they'll take this suit and, and make the next iteration, um, right. and whether right. it is a self-contained, um, life support system or not. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is the beginning of, of uh, their development and 
it's been hugely successful. This, this team is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, how far they've come over the last couple of years. Amazing. And, and, um, so, uh, it's going to be, uh, Jared and Sarah, correct? Are going outside and you two are staying inside to, uh, to you know, command and control, I guess, to make sure somebody's in there minding the fort. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, yeah. it's, Another element of the suit is is the the helmet and the visor. Yeah, um, yeah. I believe this is the only EVA suit that is one layer um, on the yeah. visor. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's that's quite unique. And there's there's multiple properties to the visor. It's got uh, uh, anti fog coating inside to you know because if you do build, build up the thermal uh, in the suit because it's it's obviously multi layered. And, uh, right. Heat retention can be a concern. Uh, there's yeah. and a fog coating, obviously the uh, the UV protection uh, from the sun. Uh, it's got the avionics um, and it's got great visibility. Um, wow! But yeah, you can see you are wearing out. a helmet. Yeah. So so us, uh, you know, with Ann and I in the capsule, we're we're the eyes and ears. Um, yeah. Uh, sit in the outboard seats in order to to monitor. Uh, the procedures because everything has been choreographed, and then we spent a lot of time in the simulator going through right. every second um, of the EVA itself. Yeah, uh, okay. and so we're there to be eyes and ears, and and you know handle uh, any emergency situation. Uh, we're there right. at the the controls to be able to to execute. Gotcha. Please tell me you're going to like sneak over to the side and look out while you got a chance, though. <laughs> I hope you get to look up and at least see. I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> I'm going to assume. There's a lot of cameras, though. Happen. Yeah, I know. I know. But you gotta, I know. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of cameras. I might get caught. You, you, you got to sneak a peek, man. <laughs> so um, uh -huh. so how how are they going to move? Obviously, you can push off from the spacecraft and go floating out into infinity. But uh, I, you know, I haven't seen that particularly. Obviously, the early Gemini's they had that little gas thruster. They ended up not using that. They ended up using handholds. I think it was Buzz Aldrin actually who came up with a lot of the methodology for climbing around the outside of the ship. Um, but how how are they going to, you know, because once you're floating out in space, unless you're pulling on the umbilical, you got nothing to hold on to. So, yeah, yeah. I, you know, this is kind of a, a baby step approach. Okay. Okay obviously concerns with, with uh, TPS on outside the capsule that we yeah. don't want to get anywhere near. Um, right. uh, there is a limitation on how long the umbilical is going to be uh, right. with restraints. So uh, initially they're just, they're going to be uh, at the top um, just outside the vehicle. Okay. Uh, so kind, a, kind of uh, like this additional like picture showing. Yeah. Okay. Where's the, so Sorry, is yeah, it more I like this? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, very similar, um, a yeah. little bit further. Um, okay. Everything's within reach from what's right. referred to as the Skywalker. It's right. the okay. device that's been developed. Uh, the lower portions there, you can see it. Um, yeah, this guy. Okay. Uh, but again, everything's within a uh, point of contact to be able to to, okay. to maintain maneuverability. Um, right. Right. You know, during okay. the, during the EVA itself. Okay, so something that's more along the lines of this image of him sort of just floating there with the long umbilical, maybe not. <laughs> that may be a little, a little we, aggrandized. We, we tried to convince the hires it be, um, but we're, we're just not quite there yet. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, that's such as life. That's okay. But I, so I just wanted to know that because, you know, I immediately, as soon as I started thinking about that, I was like, well, unless you're going to hand over hand the umbilical cord to get back, you got nothing. You're just sort of floating out there. So, yeah. So, okay. So it's yeah. going to be more like that despite, little Despite, you know, the tether being. Yeah. Right. Despite the, the tether being Kevlar and very, very sturdy, uh, they don't want us pulling on the, uh, on the single yeah. point of uh, life support. Yeah, that's that's probably wise. So okay, so it's going to be more <laughs> more along the lines of grab the little sort of hand railing thingy that's there and use that as a support. So okay, very cool. Yeah, and to, and to test the mobility and the and the the grip of uh, multi axis because uh, it's got vertical rigging, it's got uh, horizontal, uh, and the entire time they're up there, they're going through a um, a test protocol. Uh, right. to more or less grade um, how well the suit functions right. uh, in a vacuum in space. 
Okay. And I assume that you two will also do that because you'll have a chance to probably interact with the control systems and things inside the craft to make sure that they're working properly uh, in a vacuum as well. So, yeah, we have we have full reign for any type of uh, um, testing of ourselves with our arms and in our seats. It, it, the capsule is quite spacious. You know, it's yeah. Again, yeah. it's all relative. You, you go and look at the. Uh, in fact, I, I took a. a a uh, field trip over to the California Science Center just to take a look at the, uh, uh, I believe it was Gemini 11 right. capsule that right. there. Um, I was just in awe of how <laughs> little space. Yeah. Yeah. And how yeah. long they were two up weeks. There. In two weeks, space. right? I think the longest duration was two weeks, it's 14 insane. days. It's yeah, insane. That's nuts. It's not wow. much bigger than an MRI machine. Yeah, exactly. I've, um, at Kennedy Space Center, they have kind of like just boilerplate mock ups of the Gemini and the uh, Mercury. And I'm 5'10. And when I got in the, the, the Mercury capsule without a spacesuit on, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, if they closed the top, it would whack my head. <laughs> so mm-hmm. There's no yeah. room for anything in there. I was just like, this is tiny. So yeah, it's, it's pretty nuts how small the, the space was on those craft. <laughs> there's a reason yeah. why they were small guys that they, they were not allowed to be six foot. Yeah. Two or yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Jared's well over six feet. So yeah. it, it's good that uh, the, the three of us are, or small people. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. That's I got to meet him at uh at X Takeover and he was he's very thin but much taller than I expected. So I was like, "Oh, he is a pretty tall guy." So, yeah. Um well, so he'll, he'll uh, appreciate that uh, description. He's a big runner. <laughs> oh, there you go. I I yeah, I noticed that you're a, a triathlete. I've done a couple of sprint triathlons but never a, a full one. Those they're scary. So you've been out in Kona in Hawaii to do the the real big one. What's that? The Ironman. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it's the World Championships in Hawaii. I've done yeah. done fifteen uh, full Iron, uh, the Ironman distance. Um, I actually I signed up for Ironman Lake Placid. I took a ten year hiatus after I retired from the military, um, right? Because I'd done fifteen up that point, and and I uh, I wanted to get back into them uh, over the last couple of years. So I signed up for Lake Placid in twenty twenty three, thinking. Okay. You know, we're going to space. Uh, I'll have plenty of time to train. Well, right. you know, <laughs> delays happened. And so I had to punt yeah. 23 to 24. Right. Yeah. And so I was supposed that- to do it. I was training for Ironman Lake Placid. And so that got punted. And and so now I'm signed up to do uh, Ironman Chattanooga down in Tennessee. Oh, um, oh cool. Okay. Nice. In, in September. So uh, end of September. So the training is like, <laughs> it's very intense right now. Like I have a, I have a five hour bike ride in the morning. Wow. Um, you know, and today was a swim bike ride. In fact, when we're done here, I'm going to go to the pool and, and get my laps in. Jeez. That's absolutely nutty. <laughs> Plus the fact you're spending the rest of your day working on your training for the mission. So yeah, that's, that's pretty crazy. Right. So, so logistically, I I guess I wanted to ask that question and this sort of like rotates back into that, but in terms of like mental, physical and logistical training, I I was trying to come up with an umbrella term for all of the procedures that you have to learn, but what, what is a common day like for you? Maybe not while you're in the midst of training for the Ironman, but let's just cast it back three or four months where you're just kind of in a regular training mode. Oh man, there's nothing common about this entire program. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I guess the the best way to to describe it is kind of to, to characterize uh, the different types of training that we've we've gone through. You know, we right. uh, we learned a lot during Inspiration Four, which was kind of mimicked based on uh, what what NASA does for their astronauts. So right. um, we, we have the basics, you know, we have a lot of academics to learn the systems and procedures. And then we spend a lot of time in the simulators. Uh, there's, there's right. multiple types of simulators, the, the full up simulator. That's an actual castle. Uh, other than microgravity, it's the same systems. It's the same right. cargo payloads. Um, and then there's the cockpit simulators. It's more just the screens to allow us to interact and, Right. And uh, and do some training on that. So we spent a lot of time going through procedures and uh, very similar to what we do in the flying community. And, you know, being a fighter pilot in the Air Force, uh, you go through various phases of flight. You you learn the, the blocking and tackling initially, just how to fly the aircraft. 
right. uh, and then how to handle it in emergency situations. Um, and then it's like, okay, let's take this to the next level. Let's, let's go through, you know, more advanced phases. Uh, so that's where we started to add in like um, uh, contingencies for the uphill, you know, on launch, we have right. emergencies. How do we handle those as, um, as far as understanding the, the, the systems, executing the procedures, and then working together as a crew. Right. Um, okay. Uh, and, and then it's like, okay, we got to learn how to do the EVA. So uh, <laughs> yeah. we don't have the luxury of an MBL like like NASA. Um, and since this was a a developmental program, and the suit was going to uh, its creation in parallel to our training, uh, we didn't think it was um, prudent for us to try to figure out how to you know put these suits. Um, uh, in a tank and, and, and do some training that way. So what they did was come up with a very creative uh, suspension system uh, utilizing physics. They, they, um, okay. they took a harness system that you, you kind of see on uh, Cirque du Soleil, you know, this offloading type harness uh, that you could wear over the uh, externally from the, the EVA suit uh, and then when you, you know, you, you put it in certain modes, you can literally move yourself around by, by the push of a finger. Um, that's cool. As, wow. as close to microgravity as possible. Um, right. so once, you know, once you're away in, in, in lift mode, you can kind of go into this float mode and, and you can maneuver as needed, uh, in multiple axes, um, and train as necessary wow. uh, in the suit pressurized, um, on earth at one G. Yeah. So wow. we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and then uh, to kind of gel as a team, uh, we got to do a lot of the fun stuff together. So right. we did the scuba diving. We climbed mountains together. Uh, we fly cool. fighter jets together. Um, <laughs> we do a lot of that. And uh, people ask, well, why do you do all that? It's, it's, and it's, it's actually very, very productive and helpful to, to prep for what we're going to be going through. Um, right. You know, the, uh, the explanation of climbing a mountain, well, you're, you're on the side of a mountain, you're, you're dehydrated, you're dealing with altitude stress, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're grumpy because your sleep sucks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's no easy control alt delete um, right. option <laughs> on the side of a mountain. You got to do that it. That is for damn sure. That is for damn sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, so you, yeah. you end up learning a lot about yourself and, and you learn a lot about, uh, how you operate, um, as a team. Right. Um, so we did that a couple of times with Rainier and, um, cut epoxy and, and, uh, yeah. Oh, nice. You did cut epoxy. Nice. I, I, yeah, I assumed Rainier cause that just seems to be the standard mountain to climb for like that kind of training. But, uh, so interesting. Yeah. Um, so that it all sounds amazing and it sounds like the team has to gel of course as well and that's the psychology of that is very important because you're going to be in a high stress environment for five days i mean <laughs> you know that's that's kind of the the mission profile but but it sounds like it sounds like the team is a collective now it sounds like you all know each other well and and function well together i assume that millions of anomalies have been thrown your way by the simulation team they're always like ha now this just went wrong now this just went wrong so that you have like a lot of experience with with weird things happening yes yeah absolutely in fact uh it's kind of a, a, f a funny experience that we we had in the very beginning the very first sim so right. to, to put this in in context you got jared kind of already been right. through proven astronaut yeah who's already flown the same capsule that we're going to be in uh right. and then you oh, got is it literally, and Sarah is it and literally the same capsule so it's that capsule it's resilience it's the same wow. capsule so they took That's off the cupola cool. yeah yeah <laughs> and then you have okay. anna and sarah you know right. um spacex engineers with uh background being uh mission directors as well as cores and and Sarah taught Jared how to be an astronaut. So he put him through the ringer. So it was like, and then you got kid who's, you know, time to play catch up. Um, but the first sim that we had, you got a lot of, a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Uh, as soon as the anomalies started being thrown our way. Um, and I'd, I'd say more or less, we, we overthought 
uh, the circumstances and we failed miserably as a crew <laughs> on the first film. And it was a very humbling experience. Um, uh, and, and we realized, you know, we have a lot to learn uh, to function right. as a crew. Uh, but I've been very, very thankful to have the crew that we do have because, um, you know, they more or less wrote the playbook uh, on these procedures. That's one of Anna's jobs is, is to write the contingency procedures uh, in, in, in the situation of emergency. And uh, Sarah writes the training plans um, right. to put astronauts through training. Um, and Very cool. Jared's just a brilliant dude who can retain a lot of information. And oh. and you're you're like I like to hide behind those three. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, I can't even. I can't even claim that. <laughs> there you go. I'm sure you are being exceptionally humble and uh, don't deserve that. Uh, for the two SpaceX engineers, were they selected because SpaceX wants this experience internal to the company? Are they going to have something to do with the Starlink? You know, Starlink uh, laser demo that's going to be sort of it's 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 not your main comm system right it's going to be kind of running in parallel to like check it out and make sure that it works properly is that correct absolutely it's in parallel you know we have uh, our standard communication systems right uh we'll be uh downlink to ground stations and we'll be working with the uh, teacher satellites just your standard ways of communication um right what we're doing with starlink is it's kind of above and beyond and you right. know we're uh, we're going to be testing it out. Uh, uh, they'll be doing tests as soon as we're on orbit, but right. the our tests won't occur until I believe day four is when we do our oh, um, initial okay. testing. Okay. Um, uh, it, but if it, you know, if, if it far exceeds its expectations and it's running and it's working, there are opportunities for us to kind of test it out. Um, Cool. But that's kind of one of our, our, our big um, objectives is this um, global uh, communication utilizing Starlink that is right. uh, that's kind of kept under wraps. It's this uh, top secret uh, thing that we're going to be doing, uh, cool. but it will be uh, globally uh, broadcast once it, uh, it, that's if awesome. it works. Wow, cool. And of course, I think I can safely say it will involve lasers. So <laughs> we will have lasers. <laughs> exactly, lasers. <laughs> so, yeah. that, I mean, how could you go wrong if you have spaceships and lasers? I mean, that's awesome. Life is great. I know. And then the way <laughs> SpaceX does things, I mean, we're it's going to be top notch. I've seen a lot of the webcasts that they've already produced. Uh, it's really cool. That's going to be a couple hours leading up to launch. Unfortunately, right. it's like a very... Uh, oh, dark 30 type launch window. That's okay. I'll be up. Uh, and that's I'll be just up. based on, <laughs> and that's just based on uh, mitigating MMOD risks uh, and where yeah. we are in the orbit. Uh, because our, our, um, our orbit is 190, highly elliptical. It's 190 by initially 12. We'll do a couple right. passes uh, at, at 1200, check out the systems, do some, um, uh, uh, and then we'll phase up to our um, our peak apogee of fourteen hundred kilometers. Right. Um, uh, we got to get through the South Atlantic anomaly. Um, yeah, let's talk about that phase up. So a, co yeah. a, a couple of the whys. Number one, why why the South Atlantic anomaly? And I think you're going to pass through it twice, right? So that's a big deal. Um, and then second, you're going up to 1,400 kilometers, which is higher than anyone since Apollo, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, you know, and, and then you're going to lower it back down again for the spacewalk and everything. So why those two particular things? Like, those seem highly dangerous. I mean, going through the South Atlantic anomaly is something that uh, is not generally considered to be a good idea. <laughs> How's that? Which, by the way, is a big hole yeah, well, I mean, radiation shielding of the Earth. So there's a, a lot of radiation that gets down there. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and just based on us, you know, launching at a 51.6 degree, um, we're going to end up going to the anomaly at, at some point um, anyways, just based on the phasing yeah. of the orbit. It's just right. depending on the altitude, it's, it's, it's more significant at higher altitudes. Right. Um, but based on the modeling that they've done, it's, um, it's, it's similar to living on the ISS uh, our mission is similar to living on the ISS for three months. 
the, the okay. amount of radiation that's going to be exposed. Right. And the reason, you know, even to, to take a uh, the reason why we're doing it is again, it, this is, this is intent to push the envelope and, and continue to move the needle on space exploration. Um, right. We're going to have to send uh, astronauts back through um, the Van Allen belts to get to back to the moon and eventually to Mars. Uh, right. We got to understand what the impact is, is on systems as well as the human body. So um, we're, we're fully prepared to handle any anomalies that, that it, the systems experience dragons uh, mm-hmm. never been to this altitude. Right. Uh, so this will be its first. Um, uh, the reason why we chose 1400, you know, the, uh, like you reference, uh, Apollo 17 was the last time we've been this high. Obviously, they're a different ball game. They left the orbit <laughs> yeah. uh, with low Earth orbit where we're at. Uh, the highest was Gemini 11 back in 1966, uh, and they touched right around 1,369 kilometers. Uh, so we threw it out there. Higher. Hey, let's go let's, no, a little higher, 1400. Um, and we only have so many orbits through at that, at that apogee. Um, right. Again, yeah. it's, it's to, to, to manage the risks involved. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and based on the modeling that they executed, this was the protocol they came up with, with the profile. Cool. Cool. Um, a, a couple of whys. I've kept you on for a long time, so I'm going to like you know let let you go, and you could ask me questions if you want. But a, a couple of <laughs> whys. A couple of whys. First of all, and and these are not really for me, but I think for the general public. The first big why is uh, why do this? Like I, I think I'm I'm dialing it back to Apollo and thinking about you know all the protests that there were in the streets and people are like spend your money on Earth instead of in space. Why why do a mission like this? Honestly, why not? I mean, there, there's the, <laughs> awesome. The, <laughs> I mean, we're we're curious as humans. There's yeah. there's so much out there to explore, um, and it's why can't we just allocate resources to these ventures? Um, there's so much positivity that can come out, whether it's just you know as simple as inspirational. Right. Um, for us to, to venture among the stars and, and, and explore and discover new things. Um, the, the science and technology that, that is developed from these missions, you know, we, we've got 40 science and research experiments. And, and yeah. if, if our intent is to expand our space exploration and, and go for longer durations and open up the aperture and allow more people to be able right. to experience space, We've got to be able to manage healthcare uh, in general. So we're doing simple things like um, uh, doing experiments that will better understand intracranial pressure, um, right. what the impact is to that has that SANS has on the human body, space adaptation syndrome, uh, or right. space. Uh, what is it? <laughs> uh, space flight associated neuroocular syndrome. There um, we go. It's more or less yeah. when you have. Uh, the pressures are different um, on the human body than they are on, at one G uh, when you're in microgravity. Right. So we need to better understand those. So we have certain experiments that are going to address that. Um, uh, CGM, we're going to be wearing a glucose monitor. We don't know if that monitor will work in space. Yeah. Um, so okay. it's simple stuff like that is it, it, that will benefit future space travel. Um, right. As well as you know the accomplishments and the discoveries that they've done uh, historically, right. uh, we're going to try to open up those doors and and provide better healthcare here back on Earth as well. Cool, very interesting, and and I think you know the the why not is a really good answer to this thing. It's this <laughs> human beings are kind of I think by nature at least some of us are explorers. That's that's what we love to do, and kind of killing off that and saying that's not a valid endeavor is. It, it's it's a belittling or a diminishing of humanity. I think you know. I'm not saying everybody needs to be a, a crazy explorer, but there are some who do love to do that, and that's part of human nature. So yeah, right, yeah. Um, and then I I, I definitely want to touch on uh, Saint Jude. Um, 
and and I guess the question, just a general question, why do this mission with St. Jude? Obviously, Inspiration 4 was also associated with St. Jude. Uh, Jared has, I, I, I really appreciate that Jared has an idea of trying to do good for a more general public when doing these kinds of missions. So I don't know. Just what do you think about that? What do you think about that aspect of the mission? Well, St. Jude is near and dear to my heart because I, I was, you know, uh, I was given the opportunity to work closely with their team during Inspiration 4. So right. I was having daily meetings and, and I understand their organization very well. And I just absolutely loved that experience. There was nothing bad about it. And, cool. and the good that we saw by raising that quarter of a billion dollars um, in support of their efforts was extremely rewarding. Um, and, and we could see the benefit just in the patients that we were able to meet. And again, we, we want to make this bigger than ourselves. So right. based on those relationships, why not continue these efforts? Um, this is a little more on the um, uh, supporting their vision uh, mm -hmm. and awareness uh, of what they're trying to accomplish. Um, they have something, uh, they have an international program uh, where they're trying to expand uh, their reach to um, uh, more remote locations around the world. Oh, cool. uh, it's their global initiative. It's what it's referred to as. Uh, and we, we thought that was fairly consistent with, with our efforts with, with Starlink uh, yeah. and trying to expand their reach and capability around the globe by utilizing Starlink. Um, uh, and so to kind of kick this off, we, we brought a couple Starlinks uh, to very remote locations uh, that were um, concurrent with their global initiative. So we went to the Philippines. We sent some to Chile. Um, yeah. uh, we brought some over to the Ukraine as they were moving, uh, you know, at the kickoff of, of the Ukraine conflict. They were moving right. some um, uh, of their hospitals out of country. Uh, in some bordering uh, regions, uh, Moldova, Poland, uh, but they had no way to communicate. So those patients right. that were being uh, dislocated from their homes in the Ukraine, uh, they were not getting the care they needed. So we brought some uh, uh, Starling dishes over there. We brought some to the Philippines uh, and we met some patients firsthand. Uh, and this was the first time that Starlink had been brought into uh, the country, uh, Philippines. Wow. Um, wow. And so, you know, who we met were patients that would l live hours and hours uh, in the jungles uh, and be required care. Well, to receive that care, they'd have to travel uh, right. to the cities hours away from their family and friends. And sometimes their protocol requires, you know, treatment for months two, three, six yeah. months at a time. Yeah. Uh, they're not in their school. They're not getting an education. Um, they're not with their family and friends. You know, you, you provide them the Starlink. You, as long as you got electricity, they can start communicating yeah. immediately with uh, their families to get their education in these, um, in these distant locations. Uh, not to mention the, the telemedicine that, that Starlink can provide. Right. Um, you can have these, you can continue the care once these patients return back to their homes, they can continue to get uh, care via uh, Starlink um, from St. Jude. Yeah. Wow. What an amazing combination. That's just, uh, yeah. you know, to, that's, that's like a use of technology that is really, really laudable. <laughs> I mean, what can you say bad about that? That's just all to the good. And, and of course, you know, the ability to educate uh, for people to educate themselves in areas that have not had that cap capacity before. Another amazing thing that Starlink also is providing people now and, um, and telemedicine is going to only improve. So yeah, all of that is really, really impressive and amazing. Um, well, I, kid, I, I, I have to say I'm just super thrilled about this. I, all I can say is best of luck. I hope that you are going to have an amazing flight and there will not be any anomalies and it will all be smooth sailing and you'll have a great time. And hopefully we'll get a chance to, you know, chat again, like afterwards on the back end and you can talk about your experiences and maybe share a few pictures or something. <laughs> hopefully a Absolutely. little peek out, yeah, little, love to little peek out the, the, the middle to see the space again. So, yeah. <laughs>
That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's been a long time, almost what is it, fifty one years, fifty two years since uh, we've seen Earth from that distance. So. Wow, that is a laudable yeah. goal in its own right. That's amazing. Cool. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much again. And everyone, please follow Polaris Dawn. I'll put information and everything in the description, of course. You know, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be an epic journey. And please do follow along. I will try to live stream or something. So if you want to follow me on the day of the launch, which should be the 26th, as long as things don't slip at all. And uh, aside from that, everybody, we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.